God bless you and welcome to the Transformation War Sunday morning worship experience. We're delighted to have you with us today and ask you to invite others to come and join with us now as we prepare ourselves to go into worship and to give a word that the Lord has placed in my heart for us today. But right now, let us join the worship team as they come before us now. Be blessed.
out. Come on, come on. God, we give your name glory. We vow to give your name praise. We give you the vow of our beings. We give you our hearts tonight. We open up our mouths. We call you the Lion of Judah. You are the great I am. Have all shut up. And I will not be silent. I will always worship you. As long. This heart is pumping. I always worship you. Not be silent. I will always worship.
God bless you again. It is offering time. We have been blessed to have you so faithful in your giving, and we ask you now to continue to do so during this difficult time. You may do so by mailing in your contributions to 5150 Baltimore National Pike, which is the Transformation Church address. You may also give by using PushPay, instructions you will see coming up on the screen, and we've added to that also Cash App. You may use these to give your offerings to the ministry. We're very delighted to have you with us. If you use Cash App, you will use dollar sign transformation 5150. God bless you. Let us give. This morning, I wish to speak from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 7b, from the English Standard Version. Hear the words of that text. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought, and he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to a rich man, and the rich man, he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You 
are the man. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this day that you have given us, the opportunity that you've given us, O oh God. Even in this difficult time where we're experiencing things we have never experienced before in life. But God, through your word, you always help us to understand and to comprehend how we can be even better persons. We ask you to speak through this word to us today, Lord, that we may come to understand what it is that you would have us to know. Help us, Lord, always to be learning a lesson from the things we experience and become those type of persons who are sensitive to the needs of others as well as to your will for our lives, and not only that, to who we really are. So help us now, O oh God, through this word and this message, to speak to someone's heart today and to get us, God, to consider what it is that you might have us to do and what it might be that we may have to address. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Earlier this week, I woke up with this word, exposed. It happened generally toward the end of last week when we were told that we would perhaps have to mandatory wear a mask uh, when we go out into public, certainly within the grocery stores and in any other public place, uh, we were told to wear a mask. Um, and I thought about the fact of not just wearing masks, but also I thought about the fact of being exposed and the irony of masking. The irony of masking we're thinking about is yes, we're covering up to go into public places, but then there is another masking. Uh, it's the kind of masking that is invisible, the kind that uh, we don't usually pay attention to, but we are very much aware of. It's the masking that keeps hidden from others those things we don't want them to see. And it is our text today that kind of shows us this King David, who still operated as king, but he was operating wearing a mask. I came with a side or subject today that was either a subtitle to the expose the irony of masking with this question, what are we learning? Uh, this time has been a time for learning. It's a time for prayer. It's a time for doing very many things, getting closer and near to God and closer to each other. But then it comes to what are indeed we learning? It's with these words that we see David confronted with that mask that he was wearing that seemed to be invisible to others, but very clear to God. With the words, you are the man. Nathan the prophet, sent by God, exposes David, the king, as the man behind the invisible mask. He though, or he threw a parable, shared with him a story that exposed David's hypocrisy. And it was that that this one-time giant killer now finds himself weakened by the confrontation of the truth that comes from a messenger of God. David, king of Israel. David, though, a deceiver who had lusted after another man's wife, Uriah, and plotted his death to cover it up. And this grieved God. Now, in truth, afterwards, David continued to go on and do what he did. But consciously, subconsciously, he always was aware of what he had done. We can go through life always acting like nothing ever happened or it's not affecting us. But in truth, those things that go unconfessed, those things that were hidden, well, surely, as Scripture tells us, they will come to light. It's very ironic to see the reaction of David, who, after Nathan comes to him and 
more or less tells him again a parable and talks it in such a way that David then reacts as if it were a real incident. He took it and we find the Bible says that he became infuriated by the story. He was upset. The second thing he did was that he announced judgment. He said such a person as that should be killed and he should be made to pay back four times what that ewe lamb was worth. And he said he should have all of this done to him because he had no pity. Uh, the word pity could mean mercy or compassion. No feeling of sorrow. It is not the extent of empathy which is beginning to experience genuinely another's experience. It wasn't about that, but it was about the fact that he had no mercy. Everything we encounter in life should be an opportunity for us to learn. It is a learning experience. Failure to learn from our experiences is to ignore the messages that are coming through them. The poet and writer Archibald McLeish wrote, and he said this, there is only one thing more painful than learning from experience, and that is not learning from experience. We are most certainly in a learning moment. Pima Chodron, a Buddhist nun, wrote this, nothing ever goes away until it teaches us what we need to know. Nothing goes away until it teaches us what it needs us to know. There are so many things that take place and that go on that we never seem to learn the deeper message or the lesson. We see it, we hear it every day. We come and we try to comprehend, but there's so much hiddenness behind everything. But in this type of climate and environment that we're in, in the midst of this pandemic, there are a lot of things that are being exposed. And understand it is not just about the mitigation of COVID-19 or discovering a cure for it, uh, but it's also reflecting upon the relationships nationally and globally. For a long time, there's been tension between the US, us and them, if you want to place it that way. In essence, we began to look at ourselves more in a segregated way. Uh, we are the ones are, that we ought to be looking after. We are the ones <clears throat> that we ought to care for. We are the ones. We are first. But understand this, the Lord has declared unto us, and we know it in his scriptures. It says, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The whole globe belongs to God. The whole world belongs to God. We inhabit this earth together. And as such, we have responsibility to each other. Once again, I cite, love God, love neighbor, and love self. These are the three things that we've come to learn to know. God even told them in Deuteronomy, love me, love your neighbor as yourself. We have a duty and a responsibility to each other. COVID-19 has exposed to us many things. Our vulnerability to viral attacks is very well seen. And these attacks are of diverse sorts and have been exposed as well as the, the divide that still exists in our country as well as the world. If there's anything that we've seen, it's the disparities. Death of any person is tragic. 
But when we see that there is a disproportionate amount of death of those who are African American or Hispanic versus the rest of the population, almost two times more, well, something is wrong. One of the things we can look at is begin to look at systems. A system such as health systems, where there are many, still multiple millions, who are without health care, who would never follow up and even know that they had an ailment, that they had diabetes, that they had hypertension, or they had other, some kind of disease, because they just don't go to see doctors. And if they did, they could not afford. Healthcare, great disparity. And in this disparity, we find ourselves then wondering, is it anything that we could do to make this better? Some would say, I'm not my brother's keeper, but you are. We are our brother's keeper. Cultural and social bias. How much we see, how much we hear, how much the underbelly of America that reveals unto us sometimes the most tragic and the most ugly part of our nation. I am grateful to the Lord for what I'm seeing amongst those workers, those frontliners, who are working in the streets as protectors, as police, as ambulance drivers and medics, and those who are working, those nurses and doctors within hospital facilities, taking care of those who are struggling and some even succumbing to COVID-19. They're working tireless hours trying to preserve, trying to save, trying to rescue life. Uh, in times of tragedy like this, you usually see the best in people, but unfortunately we also see the worst. The economy and the wealth gap. Big disparities. The rich have more, the poor have less. And we can see the tensions. We're grateful for all of those who go out and they give. But the point that we make here is that this has all brought us to see things in a different light, in the reality of light. It is the unmasking of a real situation that needs to be addressed. Prejudicial ideology is deeply embedded. There's still hatred for other people. It's very interesting that one of the first things that happens in the midst of all of this, gun sales go way up. People are buying guns now to protect themselves from, I guess, robbers and those who may come. But then some of the reaction seems a little suspicious and shady. Understand this, you never know what is going on until something tragic happens and there is a moment of exposure. There exists a corruption of sorts in all of the aforementioned. Wealth, power, and self-interest are central to them all. We all, to some degree, wear a mask. They are, for the most part, invisible. We use them to hide what we don't want others to see or we don't want them to really see our true identity. So we hide behind the mask. And the mask that we may use may be distraction. I may blame. I may point fingers at someone else. Do anything that I can but to keep the attention from me and the real me behind my mask. We use these masks also to protect the exposure of thought or what we are really thinking. What are you really thinking? Most of us hide a lot of our real thoughts. We keep it in. We don't say anything about it. And we try to go on and behave just as if nothing was wrong. I believe this is a humbling time for us, as we mentioned a few weeks ago. This is the time for us to really look at ourselves, to do an introspection, to figure out, Lord, search me, as Psalm 139 says. 
know my heart. See if there be anything in me that is not right. Cleanse me of all wicked and unrighteous ways and set me free. In this use, when we go about protecting the exposure of our thought, we are protecting our secrets and veiling the view of the truth. Truth is hidden. One of the things that is most comfor comforting now is to at least get the reality of the truth. There's a lot that is unknown about COVID-19. Uh, it's a work in progress. Every day there's something else that's discovered. And this can cause many to feel uncomfortable. We want to hear words of hope. We want to hear words of encouragement. But more than anything, just tell me the truth. Let me know what it is that's really going on. Let me understand the reality of the thing. Let me hear and know the truth. But when we don't show the truth, when we hide behind masks, this invasion or invasive action keeps distance and separation in a deceptive way. In essence, we go on and we deceive others by living before him, before them rather, a lie. We, during this pandemic, pandemic outbreak, are asked to wear a mask not only to protect ourselves, but to protect others from the responsibility of spreading or possibility of spreading infection. Again, I looked at it one morning and reflecting on the public requirement to wear these masks and wearing masks was a demonstration that came to me of unselfishness. There's some who are protesting. I don't want to wear it. It's an invasion of everything else that I believe, my privacy and my rights. Wearing masks is perhaps the most unselfish thing that you could do because it is not about us, but it is about protecting others. Wearing masks, we're protecting our neighbor even more so than we're protecting ourselves. It comes to me that the real character of a person is revealed in difficult moments of life. Do we seek to protect ourselves first? Me first? Or do we look for others to blame for the predicament that we're in? Do we, again, as I referred to earlier, buy more guns? Or do I become a hoarder? The shelves get bare in marketplaces. And we hoard all the toilet paper and the paper towel supplies and the meat and the bread and the eggs. Empty. I was in the market one day and I, I saw one woman there that looks like she had five gallons of milk in a cart. And the milk was running thin. I don't know exactly how we go about moments like this. But this is not a time for selfishness. And what has been revealed is that there's still a good measure of selfishness amongst us, seeking our stuff first. We have no consideration for the needs of others. Our actions or questions come to me making things better or worse. Let me go back to the text today. Here is King David living his regular, ordinary life. And as he lives this ordinary life, he has a visitor come to him per the story, this parable, and um, he goes and feeds this stranger visitor from a lamb of a poor guy. Again, it is a parable. It is not what David really did. It had nothing to do with him taking the ewe lamb, but it had everything with him taking the wife of Uriah. Uriah was one of his soldiers. He was out on the front line, the battlefield. He was so dedicated 
that he would not even leave the battlefield to come to be with his wife. Even though David tried to get him to come there to cover up his act. But God sees everything. And in God seeing this, uh, he was disturbed by it. He loved David. He called David. David was chosen by him. But yet David did a thing that displeased God. So God sent Nathan to David. How gracious and how mighty and marvelous are the works of God and his love for us. He would not ignore it. But he sent someone to come to David to bring David to his senses to take the mask off of David. Not just the mask that he was using to hide what he had done from others, but we sometimes mask to hide ourselves from ourselves. And when he took it off, he did it with a very strong word. After David's fury and anger, thou art the man. I imagine David's heart broke and fell down flat. In Psalm 51, there is a story of his repentance. It is a psalm of penitence. It is a psalm that shows us what one is doing when they're sorrowful for their sin. This is a time where we must also repent. It is repenting time. It is not a matter of us trying to bolster how faithful we are, how strong we are in faith, but how humble we need to be before God because God expose and show me any and everything I need to know. Repenting brings about renewal. Confession and repentance brings renewal. The thing about the story that you'll also see in chapter 12 again of uh, the book of 2 Samuel is this. The Bible says, but after he went through all of that and David mourned the thing, uh, Nathan said, it's okay. God has forgiven you. That is the grace of God. But the grace of God comes through a lesson. The son that he had through Bathsheba was going to die, become sick and ill. And the Lord was not going to rescue him. David mourned. He laid and mourned in the dust for a long time, and they finally heard, he sensed that the child had died. They came and told him, and they were too afraid to let him know. But when he heard it, he got up, he washed himself, and he went back into the sanctuary and worshipped. This is the mightiness that still was in David. God knew his heart. God understood who he was and why he had chosen him. But there is a penalty to pay for the wrong that is done. I ask us all to just wake up and consider others even more so and better than ourselves. This is a moment in which all the mask must be removed. Everything, everything. It would be a terrible to come back finally into the house of the Lord in the sanctuary, still parading about the same attitudes, wearing the same masks, talking the same stuff, the disingenuous stuff, the stuff that we say only to say. It's time to be real. And when we come into the house of the Lord, let us come first to find God. And let God find us. God, wherever I am, whatever I bring, I am not coming to hide. I just want you to show me who I am. This is the day that God has made. This is the moment that God has made. And this is the time for removing masks. The United States, countries of the world, we need to really start looking at ourselves. What are we doing? What are we saying? What is our character revealing? 
Men and people of God, let us stand together and let us cry, cry out in truth. Not covering anything. The Bible says, and some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. But I trust in the name of the Lord. God is calling us to trust him. Not men, not systems, but him. The Lord is with us and his mercy is ever upon us. What do we do? Just as Psalm 51. Have mercy, O God, upon me. I've sinned. I've been living a lie. But thank God for grace. I pray grace into your house right now. I pray the spirit of God's presence into your house right now. I give God all the glory right now. In the midst of everything, God is working something out for your good. He knows you. He sees you. In your realness and in your unrealness. But he loves us still. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. And we praise you. Because God, while you see us as we are, you do not condemn us. But you show mercy to us by revealing unto us the truth that we're trying to hide. The secret that we're trying to protect. Help us to see our flaws. Help us to see the disparities amongst us. Help us to recognize and realize, God, that there's so many things that we need to do better. Look on our pastors, our leaders. Look on each of them, our servants, those helpers, those who are working, Lord, in those very difficult conditions. God, grant them the grace that they need to do the work that they do. And for all of those, Lord, we pray, even for those who are experiencing loss, this is a rough time to experience any type of death. But God, we pray your grace be sufficient enough to cause comfort to come that is greater than our sorrow. Look upon us now, O oh God, as we remove our mask and see also what the real underbelly of our environment is about. We must give you the praise by being honest in every way. So bless us now, O oh God, as we, as David did, give you our heart. Wash me. Make me clean. And at the very end, give me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me before we go back into the walls of sanctuaries, let our hearts be renewed. Let us find ourselves new creatures in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. It was our privilege to have you with us today and to be involved with us in terms of thought, deep thought, understanding a little bit about what we're in and what lessons we need to learn. I wish to invite you to come also this week to be with us in the various opportunities that will be presented that you'll see on the screen. I want you to know that we're going to have next Sunday a virtual communion. And that virtual communion, for those of you who want to participate in it, uh, this Wednesday between 10 and 2 and Thursday between 10 and 2, you may come by the church office and pick up your cot that you will have for Sunday as we will do communion together. We're looking forward to seeing you there. I also want you to join with us on our various platforms, which we'll also see coming up on the stream. And for those of you who are watching by way of YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That is Transformation Church Baltimore. We thank you for your participation. We thank you for your consideration, and we thank you mostly for your prayers. May God bless you. Have a great and a wonderful week as God's mercy continues to give more grace 
where grace is needed most. Bless you.